<clears throat> I'd like to uh, call the uh, Subcommittee on Government Operations uh, back to order um, after our recess. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Subcommittee has heard from um, IRS Acting Commissioner Daniel Werfel. Uh, as our first witnesses, we have three remaining witnesses. We'll go ahead and begin um, their testimony and again welcome. Uh, to our panel this morning, uh, Ms. Uh, Nina Olson, and she is the National Taxpayer Advocate at the National uh, Taxpayer Advocate Service. So welcome, and you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman Micah, and thank you for inviting me to testify today about tax-related identity theft. Since 2004, I have identified this issue as one of taxpayers' most serious problems in nearly every annual report I have submitted to Congress, and I have testified at numerous hearings on this subject, including seven since the start of 2012. To its credit, the IRS has recognized identity theft as a major challenge and has devoted significant resources to addressing it. However, while the IRS has improved its ability to detect fraudulent returns, our analysis indicates that it has not made comparable strides in providing assistance to identity theft victims. In my testimony and my reports to Congress, I have described the devastating impact of tax-related identity theft on its victims. Yet despite some recent improvals to, to cycle time, it often takes six months to a year or longer before the IRS fully resolves identity theft cases and issues refunds to the legitimate taxpayers. Thus, victim assistance overall continues to be inadequate. Let me offer three ways of looking at victim assistance. First, my organization, the Taxpayer Advocate Service, or TAS, assists taxpayers whose cases have not been handled properly through normal IRS channels or who are experiencing financial hardships. In fiscal year 2011, we received 34,000 cases, by far the largest number of cases on any single issue and 11 percent of our inventory. By fiscal year 2012, we received 55,000 identity theft cases, which constituted 25 percent of our inventory. For the first nine months of fiscal year 2013, our identity theft cases are 32 percent higher than last year, suggesting our case receipts in that issue may exceed 70,000 this year. TAS's case inventory is a pretty good barometer of IRS problems, so these increases suggest that, at least in some respects, victim assistance may actually be getting worse. Second, the IRS processes for identifying and stopping returns filed by identity thieves ensnare some legitimate returns. For example, during this filing season, more than 150,000 returns filed by legitimate taxpayers were flagged and deemed unpostable. This means they aren't processed and refunds aren't issued until someone in the IRS looks at them and acts upon them. Some returns were stopped because the original Identity Protection Personal Identification Number, or I pin was not entered on the return. The IP pin is the number the IRS gives taxpayers when it determines they are victims so their returns can go through without stopping. When a taxpayer loses his IP pin, the IRS will issue a replacement IP pin, but confoundingly, the IRS also automatically stops all returns with these replacement IP pins. That is, it deems them unpostable. Of the over 100,000 returns that were stopped because they did not have an IP PIN, more than 90 percent of those, over 93,000, were submitted by legitimate taxpayers, yet they had to wait an average of six additional weeks for the IRS to process their returns, and some are still waiting. In fact, as of yesterday, there are over 21,000 of these returns, over 61 days old on average, waiting to be processed. Third, while I am pleased that one IRS unit has reduced its processing time this year, that function's processing time is only part of the life cycle of many identity theft cases. In my written statement, I describe the process of a progress of a hypothetical case that is is representative of many of task cases in that it requires the sequential involvement of multiple IRS units. Similarly, in 2012, TIGDA analyzed the files of 17 identity theft victims and found that the IRS had opened 58 cases to resolve the accounts of those victims, an average of nearly three and a half cases per victim. That aligns with what we have observed and explains why I regularly hear from practitioners and taxpayers that identity theft cases often take a year or longer to resolve. 
Lastly, I note that the IRS now has more than 3,000 employees working identity theft cases, more than double the number from the previous year. Given the IRS's broad responsibilities and shrinking resources, that level of staffing is not sustainable. To make and sustain progress in addressing identity theft, the IRS must improve its core processes. In my written statement, I make six recommendations. The most important is to reorganize victim assistance so that a centralized unit controls all identity theft cases, and each case is assigned to an employee who manages the case from start to finish and serves as a single point of contact for the taxpayer. The IRS may say that this approach will itself require more resources, but as the head of an organization that operates in exactly that manner, I believe it is more efficient to assign each case to an employee than to require a taxpayer to navigate multiple functions working cases with significant rework and time lags occurring along the way. I thank the subcommittee for its continued interest in this matter. Thank you for your testimony. Our next uh, witness is uh, Michael McKinney, and he is the Acting Deputy Inspector General for Audit. Um, at the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. Welcome, Mr. McKinney, and you're recognized. Chairman Micah, <coughs> uh, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify on the important subject of identity theft and its impact on taxpayers and tax administration. The Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, or TIGDA, has provided extensive coverage of tax fraud related identity theft by conducting both audits and investigations. My comments today will focus on the results of our prior audit work and two audits that are ongoing. The IRS has made identity theft a priority and has made some progress over the past year. However, significant improvements are still needed. As of June 30 of this year, the IRS reported that during the 2013 filing season, it stopped the issuance of $4.2 billion in potentially fraudulent tax refunds associated with 860,000 tax returns that involve identity theft. For the 2013 filing season, the IRS increased the number of identity theft filters to 80 from the 11 it used in 2012. This enabled the IRS to identify almost twice as many identity theft tax returns as the prior year. In our follow-up audit report that will be issued next month, we determined that for tax year 2011 returns, which are filed in 2012, there were approximately 1.1 million undetected tax returns with characteristics of identity theft. The associated fraudulent tax refunds totaled approximately $3.6 billion, which is a 30 percent decrease from the $5.2 billion of undetected fraud we found for tax year 2010. Even with its expanded filters, it will remain a challenge for the IRS to detect these fraudulent returns unless it has access to third-party income and withholding information before the tax returns are processed. In this regard, the IRS is currently working with three states to determine how partial year information may be used to identify fraudulent tax returns before the refund is paid. Another challenging aspect of this problem is the use of direct deposit for the fraudulent tax refunds. Most of the tax year 2011 returns we identified with indicators of identity theft involved the use of direct deposit to obtain tax refunds. These totaled approximately $3.5 billion. In some cases, many fraudulent refunds are deposited to the same bank account. For example, one such bank account received 446 direct deposits totaling over $591,000. TIGDA recommended that the IRS limit the number of tax refunds sent to the same direct deposit account. We also recommend that the IRS work with Federal agencies and banking institutions to ensure tax refunds are deposited only to an account in the taxpayer's name. The IRS developed new filters for the 2013 filing season, which are designed to identify and stop tax returns with similar direct deposit characteristics. As of May 30th of this year, the IRS indicated that it had identified over 154,000 such tax returns and prevented approximately $470 million in tax refunds with the, with the use of these filters. In addition, as of the end of June, over 18,200 refunds were returned from financial institutions, totaling more than $60 million. The IRS still faces challenge in providing assistance to identity theft victims. In a current audit we, which reviewed cases worked in 2012, we found taxpayers have continued to face lengthy delays in the resolution of their identity theft cases. In addition, tax accounts were not always correctly resolved, which resulted in delayed or incorrect refunds. 
One practice that is designed to protect taxpayers from being victimized again the following year is the issuance of identity protection personal identification numbers. The IRS issued almost three times as many of these numbers to taxpayers in 2013 as it did in 2012. The IRS is continuing to take actions this year to improve its ability to expedite assistance to victims and prevent fraud. We will continue our work in this area to evaluate the IRS's progress. Chairman Micah, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to share my views. Thank you for your testimony, and we will turn to our last witness in this panel, uh, Mr. Douglas uh, McGinty, and he is the State Revenue Commissioner uh, at the Georgia State Department of Revenue. Welcome, and you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I am the Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Revenue, and I would like to thank you all for having me here today. Uh, first, I think it is always helpful to start a little bit with the big picture. Uh, Georgia is the ninth largest state in the Union. Uh, we have approximately 9.8 million residents, and in 2012 we had about 5 million taxpayers, 4.25 million individuals, and about 750,000 companies. In Georgia, the Department of Revenue collects about $20 billion in taxes each year, uh, which is about 98, 99 percent of all state revenue. So we are the tax collector in the state. And the vast majority of our revenue is individual income tax and sales tax, which compromise about 85 percent of all state revenue. Last year, we processed four and a quarter million individual returns. Uh, and of those, just about three million were refund requests, uh, totaling about $2 billion. So we're, like all tax and authorities, we are just a big data processor, right? We bring in $20 billion a year, but then we have to keep and manage all that information related to the $20 billion. Um, turning to the fraud issue, several years ago, long before my time at the Department, folks at the Department started to recognize that we, there was a problem with fraud and, and started trying to fight it. Uh, in 2005, a group was formed within the agency called the Office of Special Investigations. It always has to sound official and, and catchy, um, to fight the fraud. Uh, we started out by putting some pretty simple rules in place, uh, I, I gather much like the IRS in their filters, to process those returns. So as an example, if too many refunds were going to the same bank account or the same address, we would start flagging those returns. There might be a good reason that that many were going to one address or one bank account, but there might not be, and we wanted to take a closer look. Well, as we evolved and as the criminals evolved, we began to realize that the vast majority of the fraud involved individual or, excuse me, involved identity theft. Some of the fraud was the actual taxpayer uh, making fraudulent claims on their own tax return, but more often, someone was using a legitimate taxpayer's information and filing a fraudulent claim in their name. We also realized that our ability to look at a return and tell that the filer wasn't who they said was not who they said they were was very limited. Just looking at a return doesn't really tell you much, and our ability to access all sorts of third-party data was, and to a great extent, still is very limited. Taxing authorities don't have all that information most of the time. Uh, and personal experience showed it could happen to anybody. In 2011, after I'd started my job, um, my wife's identity was stolen. So when my wife and I filed our joint return, it was kicked out. Someone had already used her name and Social Security number and filed a return. Uh, and if that is not the definition of irony, I don't know what is. Um, but we had to process the paperwork both at the IRS and the, and the State level. So I understand this both from an administrative perspective but also as a semi-victim. All that said, our old rules-based approach made a difference. Last year, in 2012, for the 2011 tax year, our program stopped 114,000 refunds totaling about $75 million. Uh, but as I noted, we still knew we had a significant <coughs> hole around identity theft. And in 2011, we were approached by a company called LexisNexis to help fight that ID theft. Um, I remember clearly leaving the me meeting with LexisNexis thinking not only do they understand what the problem is, but also I think they have a program that might fix it. Often we are called on by consultants who want to sell us something. And they can help us identify the problem, which we all can see, but much less clear how they are going to fix it. So in 2012, we started this program. And it works as follows. After all of our systems are done checking a return, we think it is okay, we will send that refund request to LexisNexis with some very limited information. Uh, LexisNexis will scrub it through their databases, and based on the filters that we have set up along with them, uh, if it seems suspicious, it will be flagged. If a return is flagged, an email and a letter is sent to the taxpayer uh, asking them to go to a website and answer a few simple questions that only the taxpayer should know, much like if you have ever had your credit card stolen, same kind of system. If they can answer those questions online, 
the refund gets put back in the queue, and out it goes. Nobody has to touch it. If they can't answer it or they re refuse to try to answer the questions, we hold that refund in abeyance, and eventually we rever reverse it out and, and treat it as if it was a fraudulent refund. In putting together the program, we attempted to balance the various goals of processing refunds as quickly as possible, protecting the State's money, i.e., taxpayer money, and protecting taxpayer identities. Uh, we have run the program now for two seasons, and in the first year there was definitely a learning curve, but this year it went pretty smoothly. From our perspective and from taxpayers' perspectives, the results have been excellent. Um, it has added about one to five days to the process of a refund. Uh, and in 2012, it stopped 44, over 44,000 re refunds, totaling over $23 million. It cost the State about $2.6 million. So from a business perspective, the program is a no-brainer. We spent $2.5 million, $2.6 million, and we stopped $23 million in fraudulent refunds. Um, at the same time, the agency avoided all sorts of costs associated with having to help taxpayers deal with the mess when somebody has filed a fraudulent refund, much like my wife and I went through. So one final thought. Uh, for you all. Um, our experience is that the tax fraud is a growing and serious problem. Last year, our two programs combined stopped 160,000 fraudulent returns totaling $99 million, just shy of $100 million. And if you do the math, that means approximately 4 percent of all returns that were filed with us and over 5 percent of the refund claims fr were fraudulent. Um, I will let you do the extrapolation from that, but it doesn't take long to get to some pretty big numbers when you look at other states and obviously at the Federal level. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. I am happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Well, we thank you for your uh, testimony and each of our witnesses. And we will turn uh, immediately to some questions here. Um, again, I am conducting the first hearing on this. Uh, I heard uh, uh, one of our witnesses said she had uh, been involved in seven. And I think the subcommittee has done four of those. Uh, the the problem is though the, the with the rip off and uh, uh, refunds uh, that are fraudulent um, it's it's spun totally out of control. I mean, uh, we had four hundred and fifty six thousand cases in two hundred nine. We heard up in two thousand eleven we were at one point one million two thousand thirteen. The estimates today are one point nine million. Um, and uh, some uh, steps have been put into place, but obviously um, we don't have a handle on this. Um, did you testify, Mr. McKinney, that um, <laughs> one account received 446 uh, refunds? Yeah. I mean, it's, that's astounding that something wouldn't trigger. I just renewed my American Express uh, and they had a series of questions. And then also I found uh, any type of uh, financial activity out of the ordinary is immediately triggered. I get a call from their security folks. Uh, Mr. Werfel, can't we put in place some protections? Uh, uh, and uh, you heard recommendations or, or some ideas from Georgia. Um, where are we? Yes, we can and we should. And with respect to the situation where money goes to the same bank account, we have now effective in filing season 13 uh, implemented a filter in our system to catch it. And I think so the 446 would be triggered um, in yes. multiple? Now it would be triggered. This is, this is part of us, our evolving learning process, that as we learn and understand the schemes, we make adjustments. For us, our, the goal is to get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. So we can figure out where the schemes are going before they emerge. And that is part of our challenge at the IRS. Well, we have heard the nightmare that was described. Actually, the ranking member gave uh, his constituent uh, uh, experiences uh, and being jerked around by, uh, I think you said, a half a dozen different uh, folks. Uh, one of the recommendations from victims assistance was a, a, a central unit, I guess. Uh, uh, I imagine you'd, we have 21 units uh, or have had, and I think you'd probably have to have some enforcement or investigations units. But Mr. Werfel, what about some uh, one stop for the uh, taxpayer who's uh, caught in, in this horrible situation? 
Yeah, and we're, we're, I think that's a, re a very important thing. We're evolving in that direction. We have what's called the Identity Protection Specialization Unit that essentially helps us coordinate when you have multiple parts of the IRS involved in a single identity theft case to make sure there's coordination. But as Ms. Olson points out in her testimony, the taxpayer advocate has specific recommendations about how we can enhance that centralization role and make it even more one-stop. And for us, I'm, I'm, my commitment is to evaluate Ms. Olson's recommendation. It's a question of making sure, can we do that evolution effectively and serve the victim? And can we also uh, do it within our resource constraints? So there's a combination of things. But I think the bottom line is we're very concerned about the impact this is having on victims. Obviously, the impact it's having on the deficit in Treasury is significant. But the impact it's having on victims is significant. And we're committed to figuring out what we can do to help. Well, uh, Mr. Werfel, you've heard of Willie Sutton, haven't you, uh, the ba famous bank robber? Yes. Yeah. Well, Mr. Uh, uh, Conley. Uh, now, didn't you, uh, I thought you had some great testimony there. Did you, what was the number you said were prosecuted? Um, I have to question. I believe, Mr. Witness. Chairman, that at the last hearing we had, I want to say, because I asked, I want to say four, there were four convictions. Four convictions. Uh, we're lucky that Willie Sutton isn't around today because you could scam the uh, IRS and get away with it. If that, do you, can you tell us where we are on yeah, prosecution? We, we are, I don't have the exact number, but I can tell you that in the area of criminal investigation, just like in some of the other areas we've described, there is significant ramp up in activity. We, have a, we had 1,100 investigations underway this year. We have convictions. Um, How many? I don't know the exact number. I well, know that again, many of them uh, the are. The ranking member has said it's just a handful. And that's disgraceful. I can and, get you the number. I, mean, I will say that people some people are stealing from the taxpayer, and they're getting away with it. And uh, you heard um, the, when the staff told me that some of the drug dealers are switching out to scamming and uh, ripping off the uh, IRS with the, uh, again these illegal payments. Uh, that that should raise eyebrows because we're talking about billions. Yeah, and I, I would I would just say that we are seeing. I will get you the number of of prosecutions. We are seeing sentences now at 20 plus years, which we think is a good deterrent. We're getting positive feedback. Okay, yeah. I'm just received to know that we have seven, 785 indictments on identity fraud. I just wanted to point out that I was on the phone recently with the field directors in Tampa Bay and Miami for the IRS in terms of our work down there. And they say they've, they feel they've really turned a corner with local police and local law enforcement getting positive. Uh, feedback from local law enforcement about how the IRS efforts are stepping up in this area. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. I think the point is is that things are trending better in terms of our activity on in this area. Well, finally, uh, can you tell me again? I've heard ninety thousand to a hundred thousand employees. What's the current number of employees with IRS? It's, we have roughly 85,000 full-time employees, and then when you add in uh, part-time employees, it, it gets to about 95,000. And that's, by the way, that's an 8 percent reduction from where we were in 2010. No, again, but a lot of uh, people who are involved in this use the cost-effective means. We heard from Georgia and a limited number of personnel, a lot of electronic monitoring that is uh, that the private industry is doing in, uh, somewhere uh, we're doing it in a very expensive, ineffective uh, fashion. Let me uh, yield to uh, Mr. Conley now. Um, Mr. Chairman, I see the chairman of the full committee is here. Oh, and uh, I, uh, uh, all right, because I was, I'd be more than happy to yield to the chairman if well, he I'm, I was going to get to him immediately after you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and welcome to our panel. Um, I'm glad to hear, Mr. Werfel, that uh, the number of investigations, criminal investigations, and the number of prosecutions has gone up. Uh, I do think we need to know the number of convictions. Yeah. Um, because my recollection, honestly, was the last time we met last in the last Congress was it was in the single digits, which was a shocking statistic given the magnitude of the problem. Okay, so we have uh, 301 sentences to date in 2013. So again, the numbers are increasing. And I don't know that that's the right number. Right. I, I, you know, the trend is improving. Right. But, that, but, but I think all of us could agree, and this isn't only the responsibility of IRS, nor do I mean to imply that, but the idea that there are 1.9, almost 1.9 million cases of identity theft, which then involve the kinds of problems Mr. McGinnis and his, I mean, Mr. 
I'm sorry, McGin McGinnity. McGinnity. Sounds Irish. Yeah, a little bit. All right. Uh, and his wife experienced, uh, you know, 1.9 million. Even the, the convictions of only 300 and something people is not earth shattering and and not reassuring to the consumer, to the to the you know the taxpayer. So, are you getting cooperation from U.S. attorneys' offices on this? Are they taking this more seriously? Yeah, it's it's you know as as an emerging risk for the IRS. And for uh, the broader tax uh, community and tax system, there's there's a lot going on. You know, obviously technologies are changing. We're training our employees differently, and we're forging new partnerships with U.S. attorneys, local law enforcement, states. All of this is happening. It needs to happen quickly and effectively because, as the chairman pointed out, this is a problem, and that you pointed out, this is a problem that's growing exponentially. Right. Um, and and I think what what the what the IRS is doing is showing that we are moving quickly to deal with this emerging risk, but it's growing very quickly. Yeah. And so we need some very sophisticated solutions here. Yeah, because here's the message. You know, the chairman referenced Willie Sutton. And if Willie Sutton were in the game today, he'd probably focus on the IRS rather than a bank. Mm -hmm. Because the chances of your being caught, tried, and convicted are minuscule. I mean, it, it just, if you're looking at probabilities, it's a good place to go uh, for a uh, a penalty-free crime, and and that that is of great concern, I think, to this subcommittee. Um, and and of course, one of the things I want to give you that you you mentioned in your testimony, Mr. Werfel, that some of this has to do with resources. A billion dollars of cuts in the budget of IRS does circumscribe the IRS ability to full-throated respond to this exponential threat. Yeah, it? there's many examples of that. I mean, what what, what we are worried about is as our resources decline, can we keep up with the level of service that we need to provide to taxpayers and appropriate enforcement activities? And, you know, on the positive side, as our resources go down, we become more efficient. And I can point to a lot of different areas uh, where, and I think the chairman mentioned in our conference spending, we had a, a significant decline. And right now we're at very low levels of travel and training and conference spending as part of our efforts to become more efficient. But there's only so much efficiencies we can drive before the budget cuts start to impact our ability to tackle huge issues like identity theft. And what you know, at, at the appropriate setting, uh, we can sit down and walk through the president's 14 budget request and how we plan to deploy resources in a way to get at identity theft. I, I want to get at two other issues uh, in my limited time, Mr. McKinney. Uh, you talked about uh, direct deposit. So here is something presumably to try to uh, make more efficient and more immediate the tax refund to the taxpayer, but unwittingly it also makes more efficient and in some ways easier for uh, uh, you know, the bad guys to uh, interrupt that flow and, and uh, redirect it somewhere else. Uh, what can we do about that? Uh, and and should, should, can, should taxpayers now insist that they, they want to check and not have it directly deposited? One of the things we recommended that they do and work with Treasury on is to validate that the account that they deposit this refund into is, is an account in the taxpayer's name. And IRS has started a pilot in that regard, or, or the Treasury has, and that is starting to show a benefit. So the more they can authenticate things before they deposit into an account, the, the better off they will be. Well, but they do have the option of asking for it in, in a check form, is that correct? Yes, that's true. Um, and and do we find that the incidence of identity theft is much higher with direct deposit than it is with, say, old-fashioned? Yes, tech? most most of it's direct deposit now. It's so it's so quick for a a person to to take that and have it put to a prepaid debit card right. or whatever they can they can accomplish there whatever they're trying to do much faster. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, and I I will withhold my last question until. Unless, unless well, you thank you. No, that electronic thing doesn't work, though, because they sent my refund, but my wife got it, and I ah. knew about it. So. <laughs> uh, pleased to welcome and recognize the chair of the full committee, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll talk to Pat about joint account and the benefits thereof, I guess. Uh, Mr. Werfel, uh, this is an important hearing, and, and uh, I, I want you to continue working on it. Obviously, the IRS is behind, clearly behind the thieves. They are getting better at it. I think Mr. Connolly uh, 
brought the right point, which is why rob a bank when you can rob Medicare, Medicaid, and the IRS? It is so much easier to rob the Federal Government through fraud and identity theft, candidly, than it is to walk in with a gun into a bank. However, uh, I, have some, I have some frustrations I am bringing to you today. As you know, a number of months ago, the President made it clear that the behavior that occurred in an isolated basis in Cincinnati was unacceptable, and he charged that we would get to the bottom of it. Well, we have gotten to the fact that it is not isolated to Cincinnati, as was said. It is not isolated to Washington. It, it goes to your Chief Counsel's office. And as we go to do our discovery, that is where the rub is. You promised us full cooperation, and yet the Office of Chief Counsel apparently has 70 attorneys. They are delivering four documents a day per attorney to us, and they look like this. And there is in minute print, it says 6103. Now, if a lawyer is working on document four pages a day per lawyer, are you going to tell me that this is, in fact, a minimal redaction as required by law? Well, there is a couple of statements that I would like to make, if I could. No, I would just like your answers, please. We, the lawyers take very seriously their legal responsibilities to redact information under the law, to redact information that is specific to an individual taxpayer, and all such information, bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is all such information, whether redacted or unredacted, is delivered to this Congress. It is delivered You've to delivered less than 1 percent. Excuse me for standing, but I kind of have to get over your stack. You have delivered less than 1 percent of the documents actually uh, to the Ways and Means Committee. You are not delivering to the Ways and Means Committee. I disagree Committee. with that conclusion. I am afraid that is what Chairman Camp put out, and he put it out in writing. I disagree with that conclusion, and if I am allowed to explain, I can provide no, here's specific what, facts here's what that would support to, my uh, disagreement with that conclusion. Here is my question to you. We produced, I believe, 63 search terms. You added some search terms. I'm not disagreeing with your adding progressive and looking for progressive. That's fine. I want more, not less. You, you came up with this. It, it added up to a total of about 80 search terms. And then unilaterally, your people, the Office of Chief Counsel, reduced that down to a dozen. They are not searching on the terms we've asked for. Our request is for all information related to this. When you eliminate search terms unilaterally, you are obstructing us by limiting the scope of discovery. Do you understand that, Mr. Werfel? I do, but I disagree with the premise of your question and the facts that you are offering. Did you, in fact, did your people limit the search terms below the search terms that, were, that are delivered, actually, in your response letter today, if you have looked at it? We are prioritizing searches in order to get you more documents more quickly, and that is having an impact. In fact, this week alone, the amount of document production that we have been able to produce has increased dramatically. That doesn't mean that we have eliminated search terms permanently. It means that we are making modifications in order to make sure that, that, that we are zeroing your, in. That is not your call, Mr. Werfel. Now, let's go into a little quick detail. What is interesting about this page, I understand why you would remove uh, taxpayer specific, but this is also this information is being delivered without headers. If the names were there, I still wouldn't know what those numbers are. Somebody deliberately printed out information or actually created digital in which they stripped out the meaningful data so you know actually what these columns are. Even Mr. Connolly would say this doesn't look like a spreadsheet he's normally had because spreadsheets say what's up on top of it. Additionally, we asked you for information. We set the priority if you are going to slow roll us, and you are slow rolling us. That is not true. Mr. Werfel, you, know, you frustrated this committee. You promised to do things, and you are not. The Office of Chief Counsel, as far as we know, have made the decisions to limit search terms. Is that correct, or did you? I am working together with the Office of Chief Counsel. We are not limiting the search terms in a permanent way. We are prioritizing to get the most relevant documents. Okay, if I can make Ms. a point, if I can make a Please. point. Please. Uh, I would ask You're unanimous consent for an additional four minutes to explore this. Mr. Chairman, I will I'll gladly give that unanimous consent, provided that the Democratic side of the aisle be allowed to respond, given the fact that we ha are now off topic with respect to this hearing. 
I respect the, will, the wish and the prerogative of the Chairman to use this opportunity to query uh, Mr. Werfel on a different matter, and I respect that, but I would like an equal opportunity to respond. Oh, I would uh, grant the uh, full committee chair that time, and we will uh, grant additional time to the minority. I thank the chair for his graciousness. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Werfel. Let, let's let's go through the numbers. I thought I was I was about to. No, no. I, I, I'm only been grant, I've only been granted additional time. The, the uh, since okay since because the, Demo some, the Democrats some, seem to be carrying your water. I think I'll just use. I think there's just important facts for me to get out, and hopefully I can get. Yes, there are important facts to get out, and you're obstructing them. I am not. So now that is not true. So now and not supported, Mr. Werfel. Apparently, you were put in by the administration to run cover until somebody new would come in. Again, it, is now, it is now my time, and I am going to explain to you what this committee has found. Mr. Werfel, in two months, out of, a, out of 64 million pages, you have delivered, delivered 12,100, and this is over 2,500 of them. They are completely useless. Your interpretation of 6103 is so broad that you are delivering no meaningful information. More importantly, we have prioritized a number of discovery. Lois Lerner, a woman who did not properly but did attempt to take the fifth before our committee, we have asked for all correspondence. It has not been forthcoming. We have asked for a correspondence with the White House. Mr. Werfel, let's understand something. Correspondence with the White House, by definition, had darn well better not include 6103, so redaction is not appropriate. We are not covered by the Privacy Act. Therefore, even if it includes names of individuals like Sheldon Adelson and how you are going to target him or something, even if it included that, quite frankly, it would not be 6103. It would be communications with the outside. Additionally, your people have unilaterally chosen to redact, according to them, private information. Mr. Werfel, you don't have the right to have private communications on government time and government equipment. If Lois Lerner or others had private communications, they are not subject to 6103, because if there is 6103 in there, we expect them to be immediately referred for criminal prosecution. You can't have private conversations and release 6103. That, of course, would be wrong. So as we go through this discovery and find far excess redacting, no question at all, slow rolling discovery, limiting search terms, you may call it prioritizing, but you are not prioritizing as we need them. It is my expectation that we should have already received communications to and from the White House. We should have already ex uh, received communication between anyone who was conducting non-60103 business. We should have already received Lois Lerner's entire packet. These are not my expectations. These are the American people's expectations. Your speed of delivery is such that you will be long gone, the President will be long gone, Lois Lerner will have retired before we would receive a sufficient amount of information to be meaningful. You are leaving me no choice. I have asked you for information. You are not forthcoming. Your own Chief Counsel's Office appears to be clearly compromised. The lawyers there are included in this investigation. The communications to and from those lawyers clearly mean that the Office of Chief Counsel, a political appointed office, has been compromised. You are leaving me no choice. I will be preparing and sending a subpoena for these documents to the Secretary of the Treasury, who will be remaining on. And our expectation is that the Treasury Department will take over the delivery of documents in a timely fashion, use such attorneys as they may see fit that they believe are not compromised, and I would ask you to immediately instruct the Chief Counsel that they, the Chief Counsel's office may not any longer be part of the decision making, only attorneys who are not part of our investigation. And quite frankly, I am deeply disappointed. It was my expectation with our past relationship and your past work that you would come in not just wanting to be a caretaker, but actually get to the bottom of this. But as Cincinnati turned to Washington, Washington turned to political appointee uh, offices, and uh, the President began calling this scandal phony, and Secretary Liu began calling this scandal phony. What I can't understand is how you can think the American people would accept this as phony. This is a real investigation. We need real discovery. If these documents need to be redacted, then by definition you have no reason to deliver them. If you can only deliver me blank pages, completely blank pages, deliver them to the other committee. But I'll tell you one thing, 
as these pages, which are almost impossible to figure out where they came from, are gone through by the Ways and Means Committee, you would better hope, you would better really hope that we don't find something there that clearly should not have been redacted, which we expect we will. Moreover, I am sad to see you go because I thought you could do something. I am sad to have to issue a subpoena because that is not what I thought we were going to have. We did not enter this investigation thinking that this was some grand conspiracy. We entered this thinking this was something fundamentally wrong. My Democratic friends are convinced that progressives were targeted, even though your own Inspector General has said he found no evidence of it. Well, he did find evidence of other groups, generally called Tea Party groups, having been targeted. We don't want to find only one side. We want to find anyone that is targeted, and we want to hold people responsible. Today, Lois Lerner is being given full pay and not held accountable. Our job is to find out everyone that should be held accountable and make sure the American people can trust this will not happen again, because I believe if we are thwarted in this investigation, this will become a pattern of behavior, whether by the Chief Executive of the, of the United States or simply by individuals who have power within bureaucracies such as the IRS, the EPA, OSHA, and the like. Mr. Chairman, I now owe six minutes to the, uh, uh, the Democratic Duly member, noted. and I understand. I yield back. Duly noted. And, uh, seven, seven I recognize minutes. at this uh, point uh, the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, I, I counted seven. Uh, well, I will make that determination. Well, I am uh, just looking at the clock. Yeah. Uh, we started at four. You weren't here, sir. So no. I, I will uh, make the determination. Mr. Mr. Werfel, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized for five minutes, and then we will. I will consult with the ranking member to see how we distribute the balance of the time. I promise. Thank you, Mr. Werfel. First of all, I want to thank you for your service. Um, I listened to what just was said to you, and um, I, again, thank you for your service. Uh, earlier this week, Chairman Issa accused you of obstructing the committee's investigation because you were not producing documents fast enough, in his opinion. You have produced to Congress tens of thousands of documents. We have interviewed 18 IRS witnesses, and today is the third time you have testified personally before our committee in the last two months. In addition, Mr. Werfel, there is a law, Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code, that prohibits you from revealing information to our committee that identifies specific taxpayer information. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And you need to review all the documents you are producing to our committee to first make sure they comply with the law. Is that correct? Yes. I am not concerned with your compliance. Uh, Mr. Werfel, because I have seen it. My concern is the, the actions of the IG who is blocking you from providing information about progressive groups to this committee. Mr. Werfel, two weeks ago, on July 17th, you testified that some non-Tea Party groups received treatment similar to Tea Party applicants, and the IRS denied at least one category of applicants after a three-year review. Is that right? That is correct. In this instance, your career experts reviewed these documents and told you this information was okay to share with the committee, that it did not reveal specific taxpayer information and did not violate Section 6103. But just as you were about to produce the documents, this information, this information to the committee and the information to the committee, the IG personally intervened and claim that it might reveal specific taxpayer information. Is that right? That is correct. The IG reached out to me and expressed concerns about our pending delivery of the information. So, so you were about to hand us documents, the doc, same kind of documents Mr. Issa just asked about, but then the IG says no. Is that right? The IG raised serious concerns. When we asked the IG about this, he confirmed that his effort to block your disclosures to the committee was unprecedented. We don't hear those complaints coming from over the other side now. When we pressed him on this, he said he was still 
in ongoing, in quote, ongoing discussions with your office, and that he would resolve this issue with you, quote, sooner rather than later. The problem is we have not heard a single word from the IG since then. Can you give us an update? Has he withdrawn his objection? Are your discussions still, quote, ongoing? They are. I've spoken to him recently about it. He uh, reasserted his concern um, and indicated that he had st was still not convinced that the information was not taxpayer. The information about the progressive groups? In this case, yes. Do your career experts at IRS still believe it would be appropriate to provide this information to the committee? Yes, they do. I'm deeply disappointed that the IG continues to block the production of information about progressive groups to the committee. Representative Connolly and I sent a letter to the IG yesterday asking him for an explanation. Mr. Chairman, I ask that our letter be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. As I've said throughout this investigation, our job is to ensure that all applications for tax-exempt status are treated fairly, regardless of whether they are conservative, progressive, or in between. If we do not receive a satisfactory response from the IG by next week, I would ask that you go ahead, Mr. Werfel, and produce these documents. You know, the chairman just said, he's, he just told you he wants the documents, and so, I, so let's, let's get him the documents, even over the objection of the IG. Uh, we will fo we'll follow up and let you know if uh, we hear from him, uh, but look forward to hearing from us. Thank you. And if I can just make a point, and you know, I'm not f exactly familiar with the exact procedures of, of the committee and the hearing, but I would like an opportunity to respond to each of Chairman Ice's uh, uh, allegations and questions. A lot of them warrant uh, corrections of fact and clarification. I wish he was here for me to respond to him directly, but at some point during the course of the events today, I would appreciate the opportunity to respond. May I use my the other five um, minutes? If you would like, six. you can take. Uh, you have um, six minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Werfel. I want you to take take. You know, one of the thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that I remind my committee members is that when people come in here, they come here. These are public servants. They're giving their best, and they that family. Everybody's watching them on C-SPAN. Employees. And they never, they, accusations are made, and they never have an opportunity to respond. And it really, really bothers me. And so I want you to give, go ahead, uh, respond, if you may, and try to leave me a few more minutes, because I, I, need, uh, I need to ask you a few more questions. Yes. Do first, the best you can. First of all, the notion that we're impeding or obstructing is completely false. In fact, the opposite is true. We are involved in a thorough comprehensive effort to fully cooperate with all the congressional committees that are asking questions, asking for witnesses, asking for documents, and there's substantial facts and evidence that demonstrate our full cooperation. Now, keep in mind, I've been in seat for nine weeks, and this process is moving forward, and we're getting better and more effective at producing this discovery on a day-to-day -day basis. I have more than 100 employees working on the document requests that Chairman Issa raised a concern about. This includes 70 attorneys working full time to review documents. We are producing documents on a weekly rolling basis. This committee has over 16, as of today, will have over 16,000 <laughs> pages of documents that have been delivered. But to Congress as a whole, as of today, there will be 70,000 pages of documents delivered. Now, what's important about the redaction process here, and that's what's very important that, to make sure that uh, the public and the American people understand, is that all of these documents are being produced to Congress. We operate within legal constraints in terms of what we can deliver to who and to when. We have to protect taxpayer information, and there are rules enacted by this Congress that require that certain documents can only go to the tax committees while other documents can come to And the if you government. violate 6103, what happens? What's the penalty? It's criminal. It's a criminal violation. Jail time. Exactly. All right, go ahead. So we have Just, to, could, we, I, could I, with the gentleman yours? Of course. Um, Mr., uh, Mr. Cummings, the very same chairman who just railed against Mr. Werfel in his nine weeks uh, tenure, did he not say on June 18th, in defense of the Inspector General, Mr. George, that in erring of the side of caution, 
uh, that was the right policy with Certainly respect did. to 6103, oh. and, and therefore the withholding of documents was justified. That's right. Um, is it also true, Mr. Cummings, that, uh, that the, the, the list of search terms submitted to Mr. Werfel and IRS by the majority in this committee includes 81 items? That's right. And is one of the terms audit, the word audit? That's right. Might that generate, I don't know, a lot of paper at IRS, Mr. Cummings? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Cummings. So that, and I'm going to get to that point, but let me quickly go through some of the statistics and facts to make sure that there's an understanding of the amount of discovery that's coming across from the IRS to these committees. And intertwining that, your testimony earlier, that you're losing, I think you said 8,000 employees? Yeah, 8,000. But we're dedicated, we, we, we take this very seriously, and out of uh, chief counsel's office of 1,600 lawyers. We have 100 lawyers working on this, 100 people, 70 full time. I said there was now 70,000 pages of documents as of today, by the end of the day today, that will be delivered to Congress. These have very relevant information on them that were specifically re requested by the committees. There was a prioritization. You asked for the BOLO spreadsheets, we got you them. You asked for the emails associated with the BOLO spreadsheets, we got you them. You asked for training materials, emails of self selected, wit uh, emails that were self selected by witnesses is appearing for interviews. All of those were delivered. We have responded to 41 different uh, letters from members of the committee, including today's hearing. IRS officials, including myself, have appeared in 15 hearings since the IG report was issued. We have made 19 employees available for a total of 29 interviews. All of this, supporting all of this, is thousands and thousands of work hours as we work to be cooperative. And I think the trend here, which is important, is that the document production in particular, because that is of concern, is increasing. In fact, in fact, in this week alone, we are having increases. And the reason is, is because over the last few weeks, we have made important changes to that process. I have added more people. We are making technology enhancements. But perhaps most important to get to one of Chairman Ice's most critical concerns, which I think really warrants clarification, what happens is when we get 82 search terms, it produces a large amount of documents, a majority of which are non-responsive. And what happens is you have to look through every document. We have a responsibility to look at every page. And if you produce an enormous amount of documents to look through, it takes longer and longer to find those responsive documents and give them to you. Roughly 75 percent of all the documents that were being pulled based on the 80-plus search terms were non-responsive, yet staff time was being eaten up going through each document. So what we did is we try to help the process along, not by permanently saying we are not going to search these search terms, but by saying if we can take the search terms and ensure that we have a higher response rate in some of this information, then we are going to get the information that this committee and other committees want quicker. So no unilateral decision has been made to alter the search terms in perpetuity. Not at all. That is not true. What has happened is we have made an adjustment to the search term in order to increase the number of documents you get sooner rather than later. The fact that I am able to deliver thousands of pages of documents today is because we have made these improvements. It doesn't mean that we are not fully committed to getting all these documents. Time rhymes out. You are you're trying to obey the law. Is that what you are telling us? I am trying to obey the law. That we made, that this Congress made. Yes. And finally, I want to just interrupt the letter of August 2nd, 2013. Uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman Issa, Mr. Chairman, uh, from uh, Mr. Werfel. Uh, I would like to have that entered into the record. Without objection, Without objection so ordered. Uh, that concludes uh, uh, the time of the gentleman. And I will recognize then Mr. Thank Jordan. You, and Mr. Jordan, you have 25 seconds in addition <laughs> to the five, That's five minutes. That's, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Werfel, you know, you can 81 search terms, 12 search terms. 2,500 pages of redacted, that you know, blank pages, that whatever. When and you got reasons and you gave your explanation, that's fine. But it's been almost three months since Lois Lerner had a plan and question asked, where she told the world that this was going on, and we've been asking ever since that happened for Lois Lerner's emails, and you guys won't give them to us. Now, that is not redacted. That is not 61. We just, we just want the correspondence from the person at the center of the storm, and you guys don't give it to us. 
Now, what it seems to me that's a couple hours. You got sixteen hundred lawyers. Why, why, why can't you give us her emails? I, I don't know that that's the case. In fact, our we staff tells we me we have not all the emails. Our staff uh, told me we have not got I'll, emails I'll, from I'll, Lois Lerner. I, we should clarify that. In fact, I've received a letter recently which attached an email from Lois Lerner that we produced. I mean, so we are producing these emails. In fact, when you make a specific request we want, to us, we want the, we want the emails from anyone at the IRS correspondence with the White House. Why can't we get? We've that? looked at those too. And we've searched, and and in some ways, in some searches, we came up with uh, zero. There were no emails between that individual and the White House. But this is the point I'm trying to make. No, we you want... have a particular request. Give it to us. We'll move it higher in the priority well, list. Then why is and our we'll get you the documents. We're not getting this. Why, why are they saying we haven't we got, got it? The, I don't know. William Wilkins. We're not getting. We're not getting his his email. That's also not true. Two things about William Wilkins, if I could. One. I think today or this week we are producing, because you made a specific request, and as part of our cooperation, if, if you want to put something in the front of the line, please put something in the front of the line, because that's going to help us. It's about prioritization. The other thing about Bill Wilkins is we've offered Bill Wilkins to be interviewed by this committee. Last week we made that offer. It's a standing offer. At this time, your staff has not taken us up on this offer. Oh, we so will at some point. I hope you do, yeah. because this is not about obstruction. This is about offering as much information as we can. And the fact is, is that I know you have a lot of questions about Bill Wilkins. We want to get you those answers. We have offered him to be interviewed by your staff. You haven't taken us up on that. So I just want to be clear then. Every single email that, that, uh, of Lois Learners that we have asked for, you have sent to us? I have, uh, no, but we have provided uh, hundreds of her emails. Well, but, 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 but again, this is a process. No, no, it's, no, no, it's no, no. It's, a, it's, it's pretty simple. You go to her computer and you get her emails. It's not that simple. Well, it shouldn't take three months. Well, the, the problem, the, the well, challenge. Here's that we the have. point. Just okay. a little bit ago, you said you did send us all the information, and then I asked you the question: Did you send us every single email from Lois Lerner? And you said no. So which is it? We, did you send them all, or did you not send them all? We've sent many Lois Lerner emails, but so not that's all different of them than yet. what you first told me. You got to be square with us. I'm we being want every with you. single email from Lois Lerner. We want every single correspondence from Bill Wilkins. And we would like any correspondence between the IRS and the White House. And I, you haven't you I, haven't I, given I, all to it. And us. here's my answer if I could. Which is this I'm is giving a, you plenty of time to answer. This is a process and we are providing information on a rolling basis. We're getting it as quickly as we can to you. We don't you have a specific request. We will do our best to put well, that at the top of the priority we order. We have and get a specific request. We want every bit of correspondence from Lois Lerner, and you won't give it to us. Here's the lady who broke the story with the planet question. Here's the lady who took the fifth. Here's the lady who is at the center of this storm, and we want every bit of email from her, and you will, won't give it to us. I, I tell you what, and what I'll you've had to. three months to do it. I'll tell you what we're committed to. We're committed to reviewing every one of Lois Lerner's emails and providing the response. Some of it has to be redacted for 6103. Some of it has to be reviewed for relevance and response. Why would Lois Lerner have 6103 information in her emails? She's because a she, policy person. So she's got specific taxpayer information that she's sending all over the place? We, if, it, it, it might be very normal for Lois Lerner to email someone inside the IRS well, who's well, authorized me, to have taxpayer information. Well, let, me, let, me, let me ask you to do this for us. A lot of her emails When you are go back internal. to the office today, yes. can you tell those 70 lawyers amongst the 1,600 you have at the IRS, can you tell them to focus on one thing? Every single bit of correspondence Lois Lerner has sent to anyone on the planet we want that information given to this committee so we can get to the bottom of the story. Can you do that? I, I will go back and I will in, uh, ask the team to prioritize that over other document requests that we've received what? because yeah. you've asked. And that's, that's if part the of the partnership. If the president wants to work hand-in-hand -hand with Congress and you guys want to get to the bottom of this story, why wasn't that done back in May when this story broke. Here's the lady who was taken the fifth, who broke the story with the planted question, who tried to blame it on two rogue agents, which we know isn't true. Here's the lady at the center of the storm. Why wasn't that done the very first day you came on the job, where you said, you know what, this is the, here's the lady at the center of this whole thing. Let's get every bit of correspondence and let's get that to the committee. If the president really wants to work hand in hand with Congress to get to the truth, I would have expected that would be the very first action you would take, Mr. Werfel. And here we are three months later, and you're telling us in this committee we've only sent you some of Lois Lerner's emails. Why wasn't that done day one? I think the process— Don't you think the American people would have liked to have that information from day one? 
Yeah, I, I know a couple of responses. First, lowest learners' emails are on the top of our list, and we're working through it. That's but not we're good also enough. Producing That's not, we, want, we want them, and we wanted them in May, and you still haven't got them to it. Here is August. And August. as I've demonstrated, we've produced a lot of information to you that's highly relevant to your investigation. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Wait a second. Okay, so we've got 10 seconds. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Go ahead. May I have 10 seconds just to. Get the 10 unanimous. seconds. The gentleman just said that uh, we hadn't received. Uh, uh, documents with regard to William Wilkins. We have received, I know we haven't received all of them, but I've got them right here. If the gentleman would like to have them, I'll give them to him. Gentleman yes. yields back. Okay, I think we've got even time now, and I think Mr. Turner, the gentleman from Ohio, is uh, to be recognized now. Well, first off, let me join my colleagues, Ms. Jordan, of course, the, the chairman, and the being outraged of the fact that the IRS, in the, in the beginning, didn't tell the truth on this. We're not dealing with the IRS coming forward and saying this is what has happened either to the American public or to this committee. The, the uh, IRS came forward first with a fiction that this was something that was done by rogue agents down in IRS in Cincinnati. Now we're learning, of course, that it's not. Now they're not being forthcoming with information. And it's just, it's just astounding to have I, both members of this investigative responsibilities of this committee and certainly uh, yourself, Mr. Werfel, uh, defend not giving us and the American public information. But the chairman has said, luckily, um, you know, this, we're not dependent upon your good graces to get this information. The chairman's issuing subpoenas and we certainly have the full ability to, to use the, uh, uh, the federal government's authorities to compel your answers since you've not chosen to. And uh, I look forward to the fact that that's coming. I think it's hysterical that you keep saying we're doing this on a rolling basis because the only thing that's rolling is that you're rolling the American people and you're rolling this committee and it's going to stop. Now, getting us back on topic, um, the issue of uh, identity theft is, is certainly a very important one. And it's one that, of course, the IRS and its processes can have an effect upon where people have vulnerabilities. Uh, Commissioner McKnighty, did I pronounce that correctly? Um, I appreciate uh, your, uh, your testimony. You mentioned LexisNexis. They're actually in my community, uh, and I appreciate you working directly with them. I think it's important for us to look to uh, industry um, and um, the, the ways in which some of the data processing, data mining efforts uh, can be used to be able to detect um, uh, issues of, um, of identity theft. Uh, now, Mr. Werfel, uh, the financial industry and commercial tax software manufacturers have made recommendations to the IRS to improve its detection and prevention of identity theft. Additionally, the IRS has started two task forces to address fraud in tax preparation and bank settlement products. One positive step is the IRS's issuance of guidance that allows tax preparers to run algorithms that identify fraudulent returns and report that fraud to the IRS. The American Coalition for Taxpayer Rights has also worked with the IRS to ensure members of ACTR uh, can send real-time reports of fraud to the IRS. Uh, Mr. Werfel, the financial industry has important expertise and has taken steps to combat in identity theft. Um, how is the IRS working with the tax software companies on the issues of this problem? Also, we're aware that the state of Georgia has utilized the private sector to help identify potential fraud through third-party information. Uh, we understand the IRS has a program to receive Im information from industry. Could you describe this? Um, and how have you worked with companies to help uh, them identify uh, consumer fraud and identity theft? Well, we have a very uh, critical partnership with private industry. Uh, they often are developing and are at the cutting edge of sophisticated solutions to deal with thought, uh, fraud or error. Um, there are companies that we have uh, working at the IRS right now that help inform on our filters, uh, help inform on trends and schemes that we can help capture, help us provide us information. Um, we also uh, benchmark and see what other uh, companies are doing that can face similar challenges, whether it's a credit card company uh, or other uh, types of entities in the financial services industry. So I think that we have uh, a robust partnership uh, with, uh, with uh, private uh, companies and, and experts. Uh, and I think if we're going to tackle this issue effectively, we're going to have to stay very close with our corporate partners because they are Mr. very effective. One thing that I'm interested in specifically is, is the interface between the, um, um, the private sector and the IRS. I mean, obviously, there's a significant amount of communication that's going back and forth that includes opportunities for discovery of identity theft, uh, not just looking to how industry can be applied to your internal um, bureaucratic operations, but how also, uh, through that collaboration, identity theft might be more easily identified. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, there's there's a lot of dimensions to this problem, and very often technology is going to be a solution that helps us stay ahead of it. I mean, what we've been describing in this hearing is a problem that's emerging quicker than the solutions are to uh, to tackle it. Uh, technology is the key. Uh, Mr. Werfel, now turning back to the IRS scandal, I want to say this. You know, when you first came on and stood in front of these committees and gave everybody in the American public your uh, statement of that you were going to get to the bottom of this, uh, you don't get to just decide that. You have to actually prove it. And the, the fact that you are not standing in front of the, the committees and readily d uh, disclosing the information that would establish both what happened, and that you are stopping it and correcting it, uh, is a tremendous amount of arrogance. And I certainly hope that, uh, that, no, that you will become forthcoming. It is not true. It is just simply not true. We are providing the information. We're doing, it, we're doing it in a robust and legally appropriate way. But any indication that we're standing in the way of discovery is just not true. Thank uh, the gentleman. Uh, recognized now, uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, each one of you, for being here, uh, Mr. Werfel and Mr. McKinney. If uh, I could. Uh, I direct your attention as we look at uh, tax pre preparation in the industry and, and uh, addressing this issue of tax fraud. You know what are the recommendations that have been made that have not been addressed or that we're failing to address with regards to the IG with with areas that, because we're seeing that it's growing. According to Mr. Werfel's testimony, it says that it's growing. So what have we not addressed? At least from our perspective, the, the, the main concerns the IRS needs to be in a position to be able to do is authenticate kind of in three areas. One, as the tax return comes in the door, make sure they authenticate that's from the right taxpayer. When they validate the income and withholding, they need to run that against the income and withholding to verify that. And then on the end of where they deposit into a bank account, that also needs to be authenticated so that they deposit to a bank account that's in the name of the taxpayer. So those are the three areas where we believe it needs improvement. So why, Mr. Werfel, why do you think we have not been more um, successful in addressing that? Is this a lack of working with the tax preparers? Uh, I think, you know, I, I, we want to we want to achieve more than we can given time and resources. The schemes emerge, the identity theft problem grows quicker than we want. I'll give you an example. We, you know, one of the things that the IG has pointed out is that we can do more to use the standard uh, authentication procedures that are using uh, credit cards. Like if you are authenticating yourself, they might ask for your mother's maiden name or something that potentially the identity thief might not know about you. They might, but they might not, and it improves the, the chance. So we've developed this program we call our out-of-wallet program where we're implementing those very types of procedures. But we're finding that it takes resources. The more people... Right, so this all gets down to money? Is that what it's, you're no, saying? No, I'm just giving you an example. It's a right. combination okay. of knowing about the solution and having the resources to effectively implement it and make sure that it's going to have the most positive return on investment. So there's a lot of factors at play. All right. So, so let, me, let me go with this, because we've got an issue. You've said that this is increasing, this problem is increasing. And yet what we have is we have, and I've talked to some of the groups that are actually working to try to solve this in the private sector. And so if it's increasing and they're making recommendations on how to fix it, the private groups that you work with, where is the problem? Is it that they're making ineffective recommendations or we're just not implementing it at the IRS? Who's at fault? I think it's a, uh, I don't know if I want to say it's a fault. It's, a, it's a, an inherent reality that the problem grows quicker than our solutions can, can track it. Okay, let me, let me, yeah. so if it's growing bigger and they're identifying, because I've talked to some of the stakeholders and they have a lot of recommendations and they would indicate that y'all are not acting on a lot of their recommendations. Would you agree with that? Um, I, or are they just I'd not wanna, telling me I'd want to take some time before I would concur with that. I mean, I think we are looking. Are you aware of any times where they've made good recommendations that you have not implemented at the IRS? In preparation for this hearing, did you see, I didn't gosh, see, we I, should have done that? I didn't see any. So let me go back and talk to the team about whether there are any such situations, and I can make you aware of them. Okay. Let me go on a little bit further. And then uh, in recent years, we've seen, and you talked about uh, instances of hundreds 
of direct deposits going to banks yes. and going to the same bank account. Uh, what steps are we taking? I mean, that seems like that would be a very easy programming issue to deal with in working with financial institutions. And yet, I, I've heard of one that had 400. I've heard of another that had 1,000 going to the same bank account. You know, and yep. how, how can you not address this? Uh, we, are we are absolutely addressing it. And as I mentioned earlier. You mean you're earlier, going to be addressing it? No, we are, we are effective with filing season 13. We have put in place new filters to help us identify redundant bank accounts. And as Mr. McKinney testified uh, earlier, he gave some of the, the um, uh, facts of, of how what an impact that's having. So, yeah, I would have liked to to have ca caught that before. And this is one of those things where it's it's the scheme emerges and okay. we can hit it as All soon right. as it Let emerges, or we can be out in front and and okay. I, I would encourage you to work closer with those stakeholders to do do this. I have a few other questions here, but I'm running out of time. So let me finish with this one. Do you not see a problem with Obamacare coming in? And with the subsidies that are about to be uh, asked for, under just own, you know, in terms of just saying, well, I qualify. Do you not see schemes that could come out of that that would be that would make this pale in comparison? I, I we're certainly focusing on potential risk of fraud and yes, erroneous right. payments. Yes, you see the potential for great I see, schemes. but there is one point I want to make about the Affordable Care Act, which is important, is when people get tax credits under the Affordable Care Act to help subsidize their premiums, they don't get the money. The money goes to the insurance company. So if I am an identity thief or someone who is looking to defraud the government, I am going to I'm going to prioritize a place where I am actually going to get So what you are saying is we should just get rid of where we pay people when they haven't paid any taxes. That would get rid of all of this, all the tax credits that now we give to people when they haven't paid taxes. Now, what I'm suggesting is, is that because the Affordable Care Act is structured such as if you get the economic benefit, you don't get the money, it goes directly to the insurance company, that that is a disincentive for identity thieves and other fraudsters to come in and try to defraud that program, because there's never a point in the process where they're going to get cash in hand when they're doing that type of premium tax credit, tax credit application. That doesn't mean that in the entire life cycle of the Affordable Care Act, we aren't concern about certain vulnerabilities that we are working on. I am just suggesting that that is a critical part of IRS's role, and there you have something in place that is going to disincentivize uh, tax frauds from, from leveraging. Well, I thank the Chairman for his indulgence. Okay. Um, well, they haven't called a vote yet. They are going to call a couple of votes in a few minutes. So uh, I guess with the agreement with the uh, uh, ranking member, we will just divide uh, uh, remaining time, six minutes aside. And uh, Mr. Conley, you can divide uh, your six minutes. I'll recognize you uh, at this time. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for being fair in, uh, in allocating time. Um, let me just say, speaking for myself, Mr. Werfel, I apologize for the treatment you've gotten here today. Um, one can stand up on a pile of paper, and that act could be construed, I'm sure it was not intended, to be an intimidating act. One can use those histrionics to hide the fact that, in fact, if anybody has blocked the issuance of documents that counter a narrative, it is the Inspector General, Mr. George, who is not here today. Mr. George testified under oath in response to questioning to me that the 202 unidentified entities he was looking at he could not, there was no way of uh, ascertaining whether progressive groups could be included in their number. And yet, subsequently, uh, I believe on the 18th, in, under oath again, in response to questioning from Mr. Cartwright of this committee, he said he had indeed been apprised that there were bolos for progressive titles as well before the, the 22nd hearing. And in my view, that is at best, most charitably, an elusive answer under oath. We now have the Inspector General blocking documents being made available to this committee in an abundance of caution with respect to 6103, according to your own testimony. And it has been described as an unprecedented intervention by an IG on the eve of producing documents. 
I don't hear any outrage about that. That is just perfectly fine. It is the general counsel who is the problem. I say it is the inspector general who is the problem. I say the inspector general has not provided objective and independent analysis before this committee. I say he has compromised his integrity and his credibility as a witness in this trumped-up so-called scandal. The fact of the matter is, based on everything we know, the, the, the IRS messed up in Cincinnati. They created so-called beyond-the-lookout bolos to try to screen an avalanche of tax exemption applications, some of which were clearly triggered by the Citizen United decision by the Supreme Court. And overwhelmed, they tried to create a filter. They did it badly. They were cautioned not to do it, and they persisted. Wrong, and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are right, as are we on our side, to criticize the IRS. You came in, in the midst of that, to help try to clean that up and get to the bottom of it. And I congratulate you in trying to do so. And I have no evidence in front of me that you have done anything to obstruct or block. And I will say it is unfortunate that we could not go forward on this committee on a bipartisan basis and understand that both progressive and conservative groups apparently were targeted. And that is wrong. It is wrong if it is conservative. It is wrong if it is progressive. It is wrong if it is both. But the idea that there is some underlying scandal here that is political and goes all the way to the top was indeed the narrative before any facts were even known. And it was wrong. So I am not surprised at the drive by shooting nature of some of what has taken place here. And I regret it because I do not think it is worthy of this committee. I think we could have and should have had a bipartisan analysis of what went wrong. But that narrative just won't plow. And uh, I, Mr. Mr. Cummings, I'd be glad to yield to you, you very much. the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. I'm going back to the letter of August 2, 2013, Mr. Werfel, that I uh, introduced uh, a few minutes ago, and it states, and because I, I need this to be, I, I need the folk to hear this, um, and it states that as of today, you have provided more than 16,000 pages of documents to the committee, and more than 70,000 pages of documents to those committees that are authorized to receive taxpayer-specific information. Is that correct? Yes. Given the importance of protecting the confidentiality of taxpayer information, can you explain what additional steps are required before the IRS can produce responsive documents uh, to our committee and what you have done to uh, assure this process is uh, expedited? Yes. So under the law, we are required to uh, make sure that no information that is specific to a taxpayer uh, can be uh, disclosed to anyone that is not authorized to receive it. And under the law, the tax committees, in particular Chairman Camp, Chairman Bacchus, and their de designees, uh, under the law, are the only entities that can receive that type of information in, in Congress. And if I could offer an example, and then. Quickly, because I want to yeah, yeah. address something Mr. Jordan said. Go ahead. I just the one example I want to give. It's it's easy to pick up a document with a bunch of black on it and say you've redacted everything. This is unacceptable. But the reality is, some of the documents requested by the committees are taxpayer case files. Mm -hmm. They say I I'm going to pick taxpayer X. I want their file. I want their application for tax exempt status. I want everything associated with it. So we grab a file and give it to them, and it might be a bunch of pages. But because it's a taxpayer file, the entire file is protected under 6103, and it would be a crime for us to disclose that to any unauthorized sources. So we can have someone, you know, kind of indicating, look at all these pages that are completely blacked out. But what I want to make sure is we get the facts out. The facts are that those documents are coming to the Congress. We are working furiously to get them up here. But just the fact that they are blacked out is not in any way an obstruction. It is a legal responsibility that we have. And if there are concerns about the way in which we are redacting, I have said it before, we should talk to Chairman Camp, we should talk to Chairman Baucus. They have authorities to, to provide that information as well to other members of Congress. There is a checks and balances program here in place to make sure that the right discovery receives to the right hands. And I just want to make sure that we are leveraging those checks and balances and understanding the facts. Again, thank you for your service. I see my time has run out. Thank, you. thank the gentleman. Uh, let's see, we have uh, six and a half minutes left now. I will yield uh, four minutes to Mr. Meadows, and he can. I think he is going to yield some of that time to Mr. Jordan. 
Uh, for each one of you that have come here today, I thank you. We have a number of questions that we'll give to you. We ask that you respond in terms of uh, for those particular information. Mr. Worf, I want to give you a chance to change what you just responded to with the uh, Ranking Member Cummings. Uh, you said that we have 16,000 documents at, at this particular time in oversight, and that's... Uh, I, 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 let me clarify. Because we have 12,000. Right. Uh, today, as it's as of today... So it's scheduled so to produce by the end of the day today. It's, uh, you know, it's on schedule. I hope that's my goal, that by the end of the business today, today we have additional pages of documents that will put you at 16, about 16,500 pages for, for the total. And, will those, and that will this, those be any more meaningful than what we've already gotten? Uh, they are responsive to, to they're the documents that you've will asked for. Will they be for. any more meaningful? You're, you're an educated individual. Will yeah. they be any more meaningful? I don't know how to respond to that because they're the documents that you requested. We're trying to provide you responsive documents, so they will be meaningful in some way if they're responsive. Well, they're sending a very clear message. It's just not one I don't I, think I, that I will you say, want. if I can respond, you said any more meaningful than the documents that we provided. We provided you BOLO lists. We provided you emails associated with BOLO lists. We provided you training materials. We furnished for you 19 witnesses that have been interviewed 29 different times by committees. That's meaningful information. I think it's very meaningful information. So the notion that we're providing you information that's not meaningful, I don't think is correct. I want to clarify the record on that. Well, I'll yield to the gentleman, uh, uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you. Uh, I didn't plan on coming back, but I just want to go through a couple things. Please. According to you, nothing on this page is anything but 100 percent taxpayer-specific information, taxpayer identity information, identity. It it may be, and as I was just explaining, I think you missed it right before you came in. If I could explain. No, no, look, I've, I've gone through the 6103, and I'm going to get to my point very quickly, because Please. Mr. Cummings made a point, and it's a good one, except he made a point trying to disparage a long-serving government servant, the IG. The IG has been consistent, as far as I can tell, in a highly, highly limited release under 6103. In other words, Ranking members upset because he's not getting progressive groups that, under oath, the IG said were not targeted in his evaluation looking at the information. The amazing thing is you didn't defend him, and I'm shocked. I'm shocked that you would not at least say that the Office of the Inspector General, which includes key lieutenants, one of whom was the Democratic deputy uh, staff director here, that they are above par politics, they are above partisanship, that they have a level of consistency. Instead, you let him imply that he was basically trying to thwart an investigation on progressives. That will was you, not my intent. Will, will you make it clear today that as far as you know, he has been consistent in what he has said, that his office, although it includes people that at certain times work for Republicans or Democrats, that it is considered to be nonpartisan, and their actions to this date, to the best of your knowledge, have been above question? I will respond in this way. I have a deep respect for Russell George and his office. I have had a longstanding relationship with him and other members of the IG community. In my short tenure here, there have been moments along the way where we have disagreed. We have disagreed on the nature of whether something is 6103 protected. We have disagreed on the nature of some of the facts and data associated with the 501c4 backlog, et cetera. But to your point, I have no basis to challenge his integrity in any way, shape, or form. I think he's an individual of great integrity. And I'm glad you asked the question. Well, and his integrity was challenged by the ranking member. Oh, that's, 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 that's not true. Well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that, there you uh, go again. that the record will speak for itself. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I haven't done my second round. The, the ranking member has. Could I have my five minutes? Well, um, okay. We, we had divided time up. We have um, two and a half minutes left on our side. If I could have that, I'll be brief. Thank you. The gentleman's record. I'm asking you today, as we send a subpoena, I've signed it now, okay. to Secretary Liu, who, by the way, I'm hoping he can get above his statements on a phony scandal about this and realize this scandal's real. Real Americans were really victims. Yeah, I want more time. Now, those victims, I'd love you to, to sit down, look at the law, and make the appropriate decision, which is withholding details on people who were victimized is not the intent of 6103, and that the clear intent can be recognized. 
When you hand, oh, people are smiling and smug behind you. I just wish the camera could see their sort of, oh, well, we're not, we're going to get past that. The fact is, Chairman Camp is looking at a lot of this information. Today, you've talked about how fast you're delivering things. All you had to do was hand his people basically the keys to the search, and they could have looked online over your shoulder. They have complete right to 6103. You don't have any redacting capability. They have the right to everything you see, they can see. And, so, and still, he's received a fraction of the documents. You continue to essentially slow roll. He is getting documents in the order that you choose to give them. And that's wrong. That's just plain wrong. So we can, no, no, that's my, not true. my limited remaining time. I was with Chairman Camp earlier the, today. I've looked at his releases. I'm up to date. He is frustrated and said so in a letter to you with the speed of the release, with the fact that you don't have a reason to do anything other than comply and turn over. The fact is the American people need answers, and people who have been victimized need it. So I'm joining with the ranking member in one sense, not that you invent out of thin air and, and help support this progressive were victimized when, in fact, we have a sworn statement that they weren't, but that you make available every possible piece under a uniform interpretation of 6103. And if you want to go to the level that Mr. Uh, Cummings wants on what 6103 is, great. Be consistent, lower it to the lowest level, and more importantly, go back and soul search with that legion of attorneys and say, how in the world can we keep victims a secret? And that's what you're doing today. You're keeping victims a secret standing behind this. I do not believe that this is minimum redaction under 6103. I don't think you believe it either. And as you go off into your private life, I want you to think about the legacy of whether you helped victims or hindered this investigation. I thank the chairman and yield back. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Um, chairman. And, uh, okay, we, we could probably get two minutes in aside, Mr. Cummings, uh, two minutes. Let me be very clear. With regard to the IG, there were things that were left out of his report that he admitted, that he admitted. There was disagreement, Mr. Werfel, with regard to documents, 6103, uh, and what, what came under 6103. And clearly, you had, based on the testimony that we had in the last hearing, you had career folk whose job it was to determine what was or was not 6103 to say that these documents could be released. Is that right? That's correct. And there was disagreement. And the mere fact that one disagrees with someone does not mean you question their integrity. I disagree with my wife a lot, but I love her to life and I trust her. So, so but what we have said is that we want the truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. That's what we want. Whether it's progressives, whether it's liberals, whether it's uh, conservative, anything in between, we simply want the whole truth. And so, you know, on the one hand, they say in one hearing, oh, we've got to be real careful with 6103. Then in the next hearing, they said, damn it, we don't like the way you're dealing with 6103. Give us everything as fast as you can. Seventy lawyers, 70 lawyers working full time going through documents. On the one hand, let me tell you something. On the one hand, if you release information about taxpayers, they'd be all over you. I'm just saying, you, I mean, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And I think the best thing to do is to obey the law, period. And Mr. McKinney, you, you've got recommendations. Mr. Werfel talked about 8,000 employees, losing 8,000 employees, sequestration. How does that affect your recommendations? The loss of employees. As, as it relates to identity theft? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, well the, uh, obviously, the, when, they, when they, they have to draw, when they, when they have a problem they have to deal with, they have to draw from their existing employee base, which affects their other operations. That's the concern. And it would be a concern of ours also. Left open. Okay. They, um, let's see. You have two and a thank, half minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jordan, you're Well, right. I would just say this. They did release 6103 information. The Inspector General said so four different times, and one of those cases re was referred to the Justice Department for prosecution, and the, uh, this Justice Department won't prosecute. So they did exactly what 
I want all the information. So we have the IRS releasing 6103 information, but they can't give us Lois Lerner's emails. You can, I don't care if it, you said 70,000 pieces. You know, you can make it a million pieces of information, but if you don't give us our emails, what, what does it mean? I want the emails. Here's an example. We got some limited emails uh, regarding Mr. Wilkins. Uh, here's an email from Janine Cook, who I think works in the chief counsel's office. An email she sent to Mr. Wilkins, and she says, Bill, thought you might be interested in this. This deals with the tax code, Citizens United. She says, Bill, thought you might be interested in this in light of your earlier email. So we get that email, but we don't get the earlier email. We want all the emails. I mean, this is a great example of, you know, you, you say, well, we are sending you some. Mr. Werfel, we want them all. And, and, and why, let me ask you this, why have you limited the search why have you limited the search to May 10th, 2013? There's still all kinds of cases pending. People still haven't got a resolution to their tax exempt status. Why are you limited I, to that date? I can answer all those questions. First, let me just point out that this, this process moves forward. It's not like it, it's over today. There is a cooperation that can exist, and if you have particular documents that you are not seeing coming through in the midst of all these tens of thousands of pages, you bring it to our attention. You it's told me earlier, Mr. Occasion. Warfall, that you have not sent us all lowest limit I have, emails. We have not. We are reviewing them, and I can explain to you the subject of that review. As they are ready, they come over, but they are being reviewed for responsiveness. All right. And as an example, we might get an email that's, that, that we pull down that's an email exchange between a, a, a worker and their spouse about an upcoming medical appointment that they might have or daycare arrangements. And we're not going to send that over. It's non-responsive. And if we did send that over, you'd say you're loading these documents with things that are you know, not helpful to our review. So it's just these are just, I think, standard procedures that a government agency would go through to make sure that we're giving you... Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't brag about 70,000 pieces of information and documents you've sent over and then say, oh, but we don't want to send you too much. We want to just... We want to have you want to be to responsive. Well, That's the key. So, so if you have a particular email... I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. We'll take, all, we'll take all Lois Lerner's emails. We'll take all Bill Wilkins' emails. We'll take all the emails from, from IRS staff to the White House. We'll take all those, and we'll be the judge if you're being you're I, sending us too I'm, much information. I'm going to review them for responsiveness, right. because that's a standard procedure that's done. But let me just ask let me, one, question, one point. You, you picked up a piece of paper that we've provided to you, Discovery, and you said, this is interesting. I have an additional question based on this email. That's great. Tell us that, and we'll look for the very document that you're asking for because this is a we cooperative process. This we'll is cooperation. This is not impediment. This is cooperation, and that's my commitment. I thank the uh, gentleman, uh, both the witnesses and uh, uh, members of the panel for participating today. As we conclude, uh, just let me say that we started out, of course, on uh, the issue of um, identity fraud and the way IRS is dealing with it um, and uh, the revelations that the IRS uh, is being used somewhat as a piggy bank for fraud, fraudulent uh, tax returns right now. Um, as I said when we started, we have a, we are trying to look at some of the problems with NIRS, and we've looked at the conference spending, we've looked at the contracts, another hearing, and today the fraudulent returns. We'll continue that. We want uh, to make it uh, uh, well to correct the situation, and we do have these scandals to deal with. We diverted a bit to the, um, uh, I guess, the frustration by members on our side. And when you have, you know, thousands of pages, you did, uh, in fact, provide the pages, uh, and then the pre the president and others uh, orchestrating the phony scandal uh, uh, title to uh, to these investigations. Just in closing, I'll uh, put in this record the statement of the President in May when, when this uh, uh, became public about the scandal. Uh, I've reviewed the Treasury Department watchdog report and the misconduct that it uncovered is inexcusable. It's inexcusable and Americans are right to be angry about it and I'm angry about it and will not tolerate this kind of behavior by any agency, but especially the IRS. These are the words of the President and then he directed the Secretary Liu to, uh, of the Treasury to follow up with the IG to see who is responsible. And we're trying to find out who's responsible too, and we'll do that and continue to do that. So I thank you for being with us uh, and participating as members of the panel. 
there being no further business before the Subcommittee on Government Operations, we will leave the record open a total of uh, at least seven days uh, for additional questions may be submitted to the witnesses. Uh, again, uh, thank you for participating, and this uh, hearing is adjourned.